The Graphic Histories Podcast. I got bit by a radioactive bug. I tried experimental drugs. Went up for a stroll on a gamma testing range. I found an enchanted urucane. I made a serum that made me small. I modified the serum so it would make I me call. I got radioactive isotope in my Hey there, and welcome to the Graphic Histories Podcast. My name is Andre Mayette, and I'm your trivia host. Big thanks to Ukla the Mock for our theme song, Superpowers. And big thanks to you, gentle listener, for tuning in once again to the final episode of 2022. We put the year to a close with the first part of a two-part interview with uh, artist, former film creator, awesome guy all around, Frank Forrestal. So uh, tune into that in a few short minutes. Uh, that'll be part one. We had a great long conversation, so I thought, why not break it up into two instead of doing extensive editing, because I don't want to do that. And uh, and plus, I'd rather you guys get to hear the whole conversation. We go into some deep stuff. We talk about Frank's uh, life, about you know growing up with a famous painter father, uh, Tom Forstall, as well as trying to break into the film industry in various ways, animation, uh, the short film that I met him on, uh, which was several years ago. And, uh, you know, where we came from there. So uh, Frank's a really cool guy. I've known him for many years. I got involved with a short film he did called Jack and Joe, which I think we talk about a little more in part two, but comes up a little bit in this as well. So, uh, yeah, I mean, Frank's an awesome guy. Uh, and do a lot of the similar things we do, and we have a great conversation. We get, it gets deep on this one, which I like. The kind of uh, ones where you talk about existential horror for 15 minutes is the uh, the kind of interviews that I like. So uh, I hope you had a great Christmas. I hope you are having a good holiday. I hope you're having time off between the holidays. Sometimes some works will give that week off or, you know, people take that kind of time for vacation. Whatever way you have, I hope you're getting to enjoy it. I recently found out there was a name for the period of time between Christmas and New Year's where, you know, you spend it with family, you spend it on yourself, you uh, probably spend it drinking and uh, eating too much and just uh, generally malazing around and not doing so much. And uh, yeah, hopefully you're doing all that stuff. If so, uh, I, I feel you. I, I hear you. I hope you're uh, you're having a good time. And uh, yeah, so uh, it's called Twixmas. They call it Twixmas because it's betwixt those two holidays, which I find funny and uh, <laughs> certainly entertaining. But uh, I am enjoying my Twixmas. I am just uh, spending time with friends some family, doing some fun days out, you know, getting out, seeing some things, you know, going to Halifax and, and doing a little shopping, going to watch some movies with a friend, all the stuff I like to do, so... Thankfully, I'm getting to do that during my Twixmas uh, before New Year's comes and we all have to get back to the grindstone. Uh, yeah, so also be sure to check out our my sister podcast, which I sometimes forget to mention. Um, I, I'm with Davin Skellhorn. We do a podcast called X-Rated, the X-Men Anime Review Show, in which we watch episodes of the old 1990s Fox X-Men series and kind of critique each episode, walk through it, uh, make some, uh, some pithy commentary and observations about what we're seeing and, uh, and chat about sort of the world at large at the time period. So it's a really good time. It's a really fun, especially if you have nostalgia for that series like Davin and I do. So uh, you should definitely jump in on that and check it out. Um, yeah, and we are a proud part of the United Federation of Podcasts, which is something that a group of like-minded podcasters have put together. A lot, Many people through Davin's network, but I've logged on to. So uh, if you're listening to this uh, and support the, uh, the Federation, then, uh, then welcome to the party. Uh, if you found me through that series, I'm a little different than a lot of their stuff, but uh, not not quite. I mean, it's mostly interviews, mostly talking about genre-related things. So it's it's kind of still in the wheelhouse, and it's uh, it's going to be part of a, a a bigger group that may may draw some more attention towards my little podcast here. So anyway, uh, without much further ado, I think it's time we get into the interview in which I talk with painter, filmmaker, writer, artist. Uh, all around cool guy, Renaissance man, if you will, Frank Forstall. Still nothing, eh? Nope. Oh, there you oh, go. There's me. There you go. <laughs> there's that handsome devil. How you doing? Good. How are you? You're good. 
Good. Am I am I taking you away from creating some new piece of macabre art? As I see a lovely uh, accruing of them behind you. Uh, no, actually, today was three hours on the road looking for a Christmas tree. Oh, oh really? Yeah, I was ridiculous. Um, so what were the criteria that required such an extensive search, or was it just a tree in general? One. Uh, really? One. Yeah, yeah. It was. Uh, uh, I I'd never seen it seen the leg of it before but it was everywhere all the usual places that christmas trees have been for sale for weeks now just all packed up and gone really uh, nothing in the city yeah and you know so many people were saying to me oh just drive over here there's you know the, at, you know at the forum yeah it was a pile and they just set up yesterday okay I drove over to the forum gone um are they sold out then like is that is this i guess wow, so. wow. there was like two on right downtown it's like three within like two minutes of me on on the weekend mm -hmm. all gone all gone wow. so, um why well, is there such I, a shortage of christmas trees yeah when do we run out of trees in canada I don't know. <laughs> but so I, found I, one, I found one in beaver bank oh uh, okay vegetable uh, at, a, at a farmer's market in, in beaver bank and uh uh yeah there was uh, wasn't a great selection but i think i found a pretty good one so good do you, do you have a, you have a pretty large home right you live still in the when I met you and down in, in Dartmouth, uh, I'm back there. Yeah. 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 I was so living for a while in the, in the Valley. I still own a house out in the Valley, but, uh, I'm living in the, uh, in, uh, uh the basement, uh, apartment of the family business home. So mm -hmm. in Dartmouth. Yeah. That's, uh, that, yeah. You, you probably didn't hear. I think it's where I auditioned for the, the short film. Um, oh, was it? Yeah. if I recall correctly, I remember I went to the, the house, the big house to Dartmouth and, uh, I think I went down to the basement and we recorded that. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. think. Yeah, well, yeah, I was here in 2012, and then uh, then moved away, and then came back. So, wow, it seems like a lifetime ago. It's really strange. You know, thinking about those memories. I know. Wow, has it been ten years? Whoa. Ten years. Yeah, yeah. That one. I uh, did that one in 2012. Wow. Well, I I hope you do another one because I really really enjoyed the experience. Yeah. Someday, me. Yeah, I kind of left film behind, but uh, uh, I don't know. I'm talking to uh, you know. I always talk to my old friends in the industry, and um, uh, I I didn't want to do visual effects anymore that was i was kind of done with that that was uh um a lot of reasons for that but uh mostly just didn't make me money anymore <laughs> yeah <laughs> and it was doing it was it was you know damaging my eyes i really didn't like uh sitting at a computer all day and um not very creative work uh it's funny how people think that like there's a monotony to to certain creative endeavors like animation is incredibly seems when it's finished it's this beautiful creative like masterpiece of work you often but uh, the meticulous amount of tedious and work that goes through creating something like that like I think it was the new Spider-Man movie the new animated one uh, across the Spider-Verse or whatever like they were saying how the animators are working on it but like I think it's like a, a second a day or something is how long it takes. Oh, yeah. I can't remember from the film, like, That's which really is weird. insane. <laughs> no, not a second, maybe a minute a day or something, but like to animate yeah. that movie is like an insane amount of time. Oh yeah. 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 Like for a two hour movie, you're looking at, you know, uh, uh, night, well, 120 days of, of, uh, animation, but then that's just the actual animating. Yeah. Or rendering yeah. or whatever. So. Yeah. I was um, on the, I was on the visual effects side of it. And, um, I, the last job I took, was um in I, th I think it was last year 21 mm -hmm. and uh i thought you know that was the point of course i was starting to paint and i uh i you know my last gallery show uh opened the day lockdown started <laughs> oh so no that would that would set the tone for the last two years <laughs> uh, so yeah and somehow i managed to to keep selling and mm -hmm. uh, you know even i think in 2020 I said it was my best year ever for for painting sales, really just by reaching out to people and getting them to come to visit the studio, and then they come in and and uh, some you know, old friends bought a lot of paintings and stuff. So uh, so that was okay, but I still uh, yeah, twenty twenty one, um, I took one last job doing visual effects, and it was a blue screen project with a name, a recognizable name, which I'm not allowed to say, but it was a. Uh, uh, some brand name that you'd know and mm -hmm. um like a commercial somewhere TV commercial? It, no it was, it was a series by a, okay. a studio that you'd recommend oh i see okay yeah yeah uh but uh it was it was puppets mm -hmm. actual live puppets on blue screen 
Oh. <laughs> that was a nightmare. But yeah. was, <laughs> it, was, it, it was it was one of those things. It was like, you know, you, you, the, the perfect uh, like blue screen or green screen project. You can just go click and all the green disappears and you put something else in its place. Uh, this was not the perfect thing. They had the, you know, the puppeteers kind of just getting tired of wearing the blue mask. So they just take it off. Uh, so now I'm rotoscoping around uh, the puppets where they interfere with the puppets in the head. <laughs> painting and painting away at these things. And I was just like, this is why I stopped doing it. I hate it so much. Uh, wow. But, yeah. And rotoscope is one of those jobs where you sit like this for like six hours a day, you know, and your hand on the keyboard and the, and on the stylus, you know, like this. <laughs> no that doesn't look right delete it all start over oh my god <laughs> yeah, and, uh, yeah you know i'm happy i did not pursue exactly. a career as such um well yeah so where did you where did you begin like where were you born is it right in dartmouth there or yeah yeah actually this is the house i grew up in um, wow and um Obviously, you come from a, a lineage of art, artistic endeavors. Your father is a fairly famous uh, Canadian painter, Tom Forrestal. Yeah. yeah and yeah. Uh, was your mother into the arts as well? Uh, <laughs> she, they met at art school. Oh. Uh, but uh, my mom was all, uh, all about uh, uh, raising a big family. That's, that's what she always wanted to do. And that's what we did. And that's what she did. She had six kids. Oh, my and, God. Uh, <laughs> she, did paint, she did paint for a while. But yeah. um, uh, I remember hearing a story about uh, something about skating nuns she had an idea for skating nuns to do a painting of skating nuns my dad said hey that's a good idea i'm gonna do that too <laughs> <laughs> that's good. i'm never painting it. <laughs> so uh um, yeah i guess it's hard to compete when your your famous uh, husband also does the same has the same idea for uh, for a painting as you do uh well this was way before he was famous but no. uh, i don't i don't you know i think she 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 was a teacher when she was younger and then she um uh, I don't think she was ever going to focus, you know, uh, on art, but, uh, she, she helped my dad in the early parts of his career and got him set up with the, with the big galleries that would carry his name for many years. And, and, uh, yeah, really, you know, uh, supported him and really helped him build his career. To what it was is. growing up in a family of six kids, like must be chaotic. Oh, it was interesting. It was, it was always lively. It was always yeah. lively. And I was the youngest. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, the youngest is six. So, um, yeah, growing up, I was always, uh, you know, my oldest brother, William, I think, uh, went away to university when I was uh, maybe eight, mm -hmm. uh, eight or seven or eight. And um, so from that point, you know, all, all my siblings, one after the other, were, were moving away and stuff. So, um, and by the time I was a teenager, I was, uh, I was alone in this big house with, uh, with my parents. And uh, to a large degree, they all got into the arts in one way or another. Mm -hmm. And um, it was just my brother, Jack, who who didn't get into arts. And he was the... I love how the black sheep of the family is the one who didn't go into art. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, was, yeah, yeah. That's, that's an amazing sort of, uh, you know, ironic twist when it comes to an ironic... Like a friend of mine used to always joke that if I ever had a kid, which I never did, that they would probably be like a football player or something that was like, not that didn't interest me at all. Like hockey, you know, <laughs> yeah. I'd be like, you know, I'd be like, just read this comic book. And he'd be like, screw you, dad. I'm going to play football. And I'd be like, no, you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the rebellious kid goes into like accounting or, or something, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was uh, the one, the one who didn't get into art was my brother, Jack. Mm -hmm. And uh, of all of us, he has, he's had the, he had the most storied life. He passed away in uh, 2016. Oh, I'm sorry uh, to hear that. Uh, well, he, it was it was cancer that got him, but uh, he really should have been taken out so many other times. <laughs> it was his adventures, he was the world traveler, and he went into some of the craziest parts of the world. Um, and uh, you know, he he did a lot of video documentation, but uh, as far as I know, he never actually cut any of it into documentaries and stuff. There's mountains of of uh, tape around from when uh, when he traveled, but uh, wow. He was just all about the experience of traveling, I think. And uh, he taught English in different countries. Um, so, you know, for, for years, he was teaching the high-end executives at Sony in Japan. And um, his, last, his last adventure, he was uh, like sidekick to a Turkish billionaire. Uh, <laughs> so, How would you land a gig like that? So, <laughs> you know, he was teaching English. And then, uh, you know, like, well, when he was in Japan, uh, you know, like top executives, like CEOs and stuff would, uh, would get them to just go out 
for dinner so they could have a conversation in English. And, uh, you know, you just have the gift of the gab. And uh, uh, so, you know, just charm everybody around him. And, and then uh, so somehow, yeah, he landed in the pocket of this Turkish billionaire uh, who was, <laughs> I guess, a, a street, street kid growing up. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And then just somehow got involved, you know, just became this brilliant businessman. And um, yeah, Jack followed him around, talked, spoke English with him. That was <laughs> wow. Uh, it's a, you know, you, you think that it's, it's a shame when obviously someone lives a, a shorter life than, than what you would expect. But um, I mean, I guess he, how would he have been when he passed away? I think he was 52. Oh, that's pretty young. Um, yeah. You know, to but to have lived, to have used those years in a way like that, to have to see the world and, and go to these crazy places, like it, it's uh, yeah. You know, at least at least the time spent was spent well. That's uh, yeah. I could sit here. I could sit here. Like it would take two hours. You know, you could do a two-hour <laughs> podcast on on the stories that I've heard about him and other the stories that other people have brought to me too. Like uh, uh, when we had a wake here, he was. Uh, I was meeting people who were just telling me these crazy stories, things I never heard about him. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I think one of my favorites. I'll just, I'll just, but I'm assuming it's not surprising to you to hear these, like surprising to hear that, but like the kind of person he was to you, you like, you could expect him to do these sort of things. I didn't, yeah, I didn't doubt any of the stories. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Was like, they surprised you like at a left field. They're like, Oh, look how crazy your brother was. Yeah. 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 So I think uh, one of my favorite stories is uh, uh, he was being, he was, he was once attacked by an ax wielding North Korean farmer in the wilderness. Uh, and was he in North Korea? Uh, he was in South Korea, but uh, he, he and his he and his uh, fiance had gone camping up near the DMZ, and uh, just pitched a tent near the near the near the edge of a river somewheres. And uh, they've been traveling all day, so he just crawled into the tent and crashed, wearing his whole um, motorcycle leathers and stuff. Uh, and um, in the middle of the night, his uh, Christine, his 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 fiance, was waking him up and saying, "Jack." Jack, there's somebody in the tent with us, and uh, he thought he, he thought she was just joking. I go back to sleep, Christine, like this, and uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and then and she's no, no, really, there's somebody in here. And then he could feel somebody like stepping on his legs, and then he turns on a flashlight, and there was this tiny emaciated man holding an axe, but just like starving. Uh, and uh, and oh my Jack, God. yeah, and Jack Jack wasn't a big guy either. So yeah, he, he grabs the axe. And he tries to take it, take it out of the hand, but the guy's like a rag doll, just going wherever, oh, really? wherever he pulls the axe, right? So, uh, uh, so he finally like drags him out of the tent, and the guy was at first like really fighting with him, but then after a few minutes, just got exhausted because mm. starving, right? And uh, and Christine said, "Well, he, he seems to have calmed down. Maybe you can let go." Jack lets go of the axe, she, bink, just <laughs> knocks him right on the forehead with the oh. axe. It, you know, not not hard at all, but just. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, so they grabs the axe again starts start trying to take the axe and they they slip down the the bank and fall into the river and um jack says that's when that's when they when he felt the cold water he, that's when he really woke up and uh and then kicked the guy in the crotch and then the guy immediately let go of the axe and just ran off into the into the woods jesus <laughs> they, they, you know, they, they went and talked to the authorities about it and they were like, uh, from the sounds of it, it, it sounded like just, you know, some North Korean farmer who wound his way through the uh, the the minefields between mm-hmm. the two countries, right? The DMZ area. Yeah. And just, just escaped and, you know, was just robbing people or something. I don't know. Jeez. Yeah. Jesus Christ. <laughs> another one of his nine lives just checked off. Right That's there. an amazing story. <laughs> Holy crap. Yeah. Just, just get in a fight with. I think getting in a fight with the North Korean in general would be notable, but with an axe wheeling one in the wild, and the, just outside the DMZ, is uh, pretty yeah. impressive. Holy crap! <laughs> so, uh, like growing up in that household, I guess, like so you mentioned, all your 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 siblings all had an artistic bend to yeah. them, and with with the exception of Jack. But like, was it just like art constantly all the time? Like, so your father? Oh yeah, yeah. It was yeah. That was the conversation at uh, the dinner table all the time. Uh, mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, as they went to, to university and studied here and there and come back with different creative theories and that all got mixed into the conversation. So, uh, um, like really progressive household. I guess so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was just kind of the thing that dad did when I was growing up. So <laughs> I was, I was kind of, I thought it was kind of strange when I went over to other people's place where, you know, where's your dad work? 
at his job, you know, over there, <laughs> you know, on the other side of town. Oh, that's strange. I strange. Mine's, in, mine's in the basement or the attic, just, uh, just painting yeah. away. Yeah, yeah. So was he, I assume he was encouraging of, of artistic leanings from all his kids and being that, you know, he, it was his career as well. Well, you know what? It was, it was kind of a hands-off encouragement. It was, it was kind of nice that way. Um, it was, I think he had like the only really rule about it was that he didn't like seeing coloring books around the house. Really? Yeah. Cause coloring books are, you're finishing someone else's work, mm. you know, it's not yours. And if you if you're just coloring in from a coloring book, then you, you kind of almost well you undermine your own ability to draw anything, you know. Uh, so you know, as, as a child, like uh, you know, you always feel like you got that sense of accomplishment. You, you finish a color, but you you didn't draw it, so you always feel like you could never have done that without the coloring book kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So he would bring back mountains of uh, uh, paper from uh like print shops would give them like cut ends of paper and stuff and i just remember the house just being filled with piles of blank paper and and material like uh, drawing materials and stuff so uh yeah you know it was, it was an easy way to entertain yourself I, i'd come home from school and just sit down and draw and draw and draw so wow uh yeah just kind of grew up with that. i assume he wasn't overly critical of whatever you're producing at this age he was just letting you go free flowing go yeah 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 uh, actually uh it's funny uh, when I, from when i was a kid i can only ever remember him giving me one uh lesson or instruction or anything like that and mm-hmm. I, was, I was really little and i was sitting at the table and i would draw these people that kind of just looked like eggs mm-hmm. uh so just a circle and you know, scribble the hair on top and a couple of eyes and then the arms would come out like, like just lines coming out. And when I got to the end of a limb, either the hand or the, the feet, I would take my marker and I go jab, 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 just make these dots. And those were the fingers. Mm-hmm. And I remember him looking at, asking me, but what, what are you doing there? It was like, those are the fingers. And it was like 20 dots on, <laughs> on one hand, you know, <laughs> and, uh, so, and he just goes like this. He goes, doesn't that look more like a line than a dot? And he just walked away. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I love you. Got I started observing things a little more carefully. You're right. That's brilliant. <laughs> um, that's amazing. Yeah. I love that. That was one instructional piece through it. I mean, yeah. did he become like when you when you got into painting later? Like, were you you always was painting just something you would you picked up in the last little while? But I assume you've been doing it your whole life because there's yeah, it's always been there. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, yeah, I mean. I, I, I look at it now like, you know, my, my, my time in film seemed to be like a detour for a while, mm-hmm. but I, I always drew there. I always enjoyed, um, you know, uh, concept art and design. That was always my favorite kind of work that I was pulling in when I was in the, uh, when I was in the film industry is, you know, designing new things. And um, so I became a Photoshop master and um, doing yeah, anything that was sort of creative, hands-on, rather than you know actually editing and and the other the other parts of filmmaking. So that was always there. And um, when I started to uh, really paint in earnest, uh, that was probably that was around 2016. Mm-hmm. Or, yeah, around 2016. I was kind of I started then, and um, I think the first kind of gallery show I, I I did from that was maybe 2017, 2018. Mm-hmm. You, might, you might've been to that at the uh, plan B. Yes. I did get on that. Yes. Yeah. 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 So that was kind of yeah, a little DIY show I did there. And, and Bob was great to, to let me have the space for a couple of months. I missed that place. Uh, I like that place. That's a great place. Yeah. That was yeah. great. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, since then uh, I've been living here. So I decided to just take advantage of, you know, being in proximity to my dad Mm-hmm. So um, I was going to say, was he more critical toward not critical, but like um, helpful in, in the uh, sort of growth of your art uh, now that you're sort of more fully formed as an artist, as an adult? Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. Well, I mean, I, you know, I invite him in to give critique all the time or, uh, you know, I'm down here in, in the basement. He's up in uh, on the top floor in his studio and uh, usually meet around four, four o'clock for tea in the afternoon and whatever I'm working on, I'll bring up and, and he'll give me feedback on it. So really, Oh yeah. 
Yeah. Wow. That sounds like quite the creative. Like I would, that sounds like an amazing, like it, it sounds like a, like an independent film in itself. Just this idea of like the father upstairs painting the son downstairs. Yeah. So real interesting iconography with all that. And it's very interesting. That's uh, it's very cool. Yeah. 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 Well, I was pretty lucky to have that. So it mm. was the, yeah, uh, he's getting on an age is 86 now. So that was, that was the yeah, I, I, I went to do a small amount of research getting into this and I saw his birthday was like in like 36. Yeah. Yeah, and I was like, "Oh my god, <laughs> that's uh, you know, that's uh, yeah." He'd be getting getting up there, so yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I assume he hasn't missed a step when it comes to uh, to painting. Oh, never. Yeah, yeah. He's doing he's doing really well now. He's got a he's got a show touring around, um, uh, of his sketchbooks. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, he's got a lifetime's worth of sketchbooks. Um, I think it's like four hundred um and uh, as 10 years ago or so uh we had them digitized and um you know just set up with a camera and, and, and photographed every page and then uh, a couple of months ago uh, i had to just update that so i digitized the last 10 years of his sketchbooks and that took me four days of just turning pages click 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 and um i put on uh, you can find it i put that on youtube I, Are you I, doing I, it? I, what's that? Are you doing the actual photography? Uh, of, no, of, of the um, I, I I put them into a sequence every oh. photograph, so that it was one frame per per, per photo. Mm-hmm. So they're blasting past you at uh, at <laughs> well, two pages per photo uh, at at thirty frames per second. Wow! And I just set some music to it, and uh, just the impact because you're watching this, but your brain can only pick up like one image every three or four seconds. So uh you know they're just just flashing past you so fast so you you know i would watch it again and again just like yeah they're you know i see something completely different each time but uh it's very uh, interesting do you ever see the movie is a 24 frames it's an iranian director did it it's um it's similar to that it's like it's a he's a photographer but it's it's like the frames of his photographs with music and that's all the movie is oh really yeah it's it's uh i know criterion put it a few years ago on blu-ray but uh um it's very interesting it's uh it's very dreamlike in sort of the way it it, tra- it kind of reminded me a bit of that um that 360 um van gogh exhibit they did you know with oh the, right uh, yeah it was just yeah. the the constant things bleeding into each other but yeah it's a very yeah check that out it's, uh he's an iranian director abbas kiristami but uh I, I don't know anything else he's done besides that but it was very interesting uh kind of dreamy take with a similar idea Cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's really interesting. So, uh, well, when you were ready to go on yourself to the secondary education, you went into, uh, was it the, the visual arts specifically? Oh, what did I go? I went to NASCAD. Yeah. And um, uh, is the Nova started. Scotia College of Art and Design, I believe is what it's yeah. first for yeah. the, the uninitiated. Hopefully I have some international listeners who are familiar. Oh yeah. 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 So, um, and that was, that was kind of a strange time in, in for the school. They had an unusual, um, uh, sort of glut of, um, of graduating students in the in the two years that I was there. Uh, there were so many sort of graduating students who had finished their focus and uh, just had to hang around and do other stuff. So they started taking all of the first year courses. Uh, so for two years, I couldn't get into anything that I wanted to. I wanted to do photography or color photography or painting or uh, a lot of these things. And there was just no room. Uh, really? Yeah, <laughs> it, was, it was so aggravating. And I uh, ended up doing uh, printmaking, which I never really clung to. And um, I have a friend who's an artist, and that's what he did. Uh, printmaking, same, yeah. yeah, printmaking it. Yeah. yeah, same yeah. thing. And I did. I did some interesting things. It's 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 an interesting process, but you know, to do it regularly, you need gear that you know, you know thousands of dollars worth of gear to do it. So, uh, mm-hmm. and I learned intaglio and lithography. So that's that's heavy heavy duty gear, which I didn't have access to. So. Mm-hmm. I wasn't particularly interested, but um, but I got into the film stuff that was going on that they had, and uh, the school didn't have a film program as they do today, but they did have little things like uh, a Super 8 film class, 16 millimeter film class, and video, and uh, yeah, just a handful of little things. So I did I did as much as I could with those in the two years, and then. Um, uh, uh, and then I just jumped ship and I went to, uh, oh, what the heck was it? It was a, a little uh, trade school for animation, mm-hmm. for 3D animation. 
Uh, they're gone now. They were called McKenzie College. I think it was just one classroom sort of uh, boot camp. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Boot camp thing, yeah. And um, so I did that. And then that sort of launched me into film, uh, into the film world. Although I didn't get in right away. Let's see, it was, I looked around for a long time. I think I was, after that, I came out, they, you know, they made a lot of promises that they'd help you get work and stuff. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, you know, this is, this is a time when the internet was still kind of new. Mm -hmm. I don't think I had an email address at that point. And, uh, <laughs> uh, you so, speak, you know, I was, speak of a time I'm unfamiliar with, sir. Yeah. I was bringing VHS videotapes to companies that might hire somebody like me, but, uh, uh, you know, there was, there was, maybe one or two animation studios in Halifax, the tiny little boutique places. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, unlike today, I think there's three now. Four. Yeah, there's some fairly, there's some ones doing some fairly big work of our call. What's the one that I always forget? That's a big one. Some dog, is that right? Is there one? Wow. Uh, uh, no, maybe I'm wrong, but there's a couple, yeah, there's a couple of, of the people that I've known through the years who have worked for some of those, from those houses working on, um, uh, I think it was like Inspector Gadget and some other shows like that, like newer versions of that. And I can't remember the, all of them, but I know. I was, yeah, maybe that's it. Maybe that's it was, that was that was Halifax film became DHX. Yeah. Uh, now it's called IOM Island of Misfits. So. Oh, really? That's funny. Yeah. So I'm kind of out of loop on all that, but that's that's one of the big ones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, but uh, um, yeah. Copernicus, is that the one I'm thinking of? Copernicus, yeah, I was. That, there. Yeah, oh, yeah, that's what I'm thinking of. Yeah, and uh, but uh, yeah, so yeah, that time there was there was really no opportunities, and uh, I was actually like when I graduated from that animation boot camp, I had uh, uh, my my wife at the time had a had a baby on the way, mm -hmm. so I wasn't picking up to move to Toronto in any hurry. So I kind of decided I was going to stick around here. I was, I was bucking the trend too. I was watching all of my friends go go out west for work because uh, that was really the best option. Or you could stay here and um, work at Tim Hortons. You know, it was yeah. Uh, uh, that, that's that's what it looked like. You know. Um, so did you meet the wife while you were in college? Because you must have been pretty young at this point, were you? No. Well, it was it was between um, between those two years at at, uh, at art school. Oh yes, uh, and. The, the animation boot camp because I, yeah I went I went traveling up to the UK where I ended up uh, getting a job in a nightclub there and what where, did you do at a nightclub uh I served sort of bar oh, oh okay bartender yeah yeah, yeah. classic yeah. like that was, that was fun yeah that was I can't remember what year I guess that was 90 93 94 are you a novelty as a Canadian working at a nightclub in the UK I thought it was Irish I don't know oh why. really really yeah. <laughs> that was always their first guess. Yeah, I would. I would have thought they would. They they would guess American first, but no, Irish and then American. Um, but uh, oh yeah, it was hilarious. The uh, it was a nightclub in Cardiff, Wales. Uh, I'm a Doctor Who fan, so I know where Cardiff is. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah it's referenced uh, all the time in that show. Yeah, well, it was a tough town in those mm. days. I don't know what it's like now, but uh, you know, it's always been a, like an industrial. Uh, you know, factory town workers and stuff. And at the time, closed circuit television was really popular in the downtown cores of uh, all, all the British cities. I'm sure it's just expanded now. But uh, at the time, it was like, you know, this area of 10 blocks. So if you look at a map of downtown Cardiff, here's all the areas with the, um, with the uh, closed circuit television. And the place I worked was just on the edge of that. Mm -hmm. So if you're somebody who didn't want to be seen on closed circuit television, you'd come to our place. <laughs> <laughs> so we had it was a tough crowd going through there it's uh, funny because I, I assume you ever read um or watched uh v for vendetta yeah yeah so oh, yeah, yeah that, that whole idea behind that i mean kind of big brothery uh state with all the closed circuit television watching everything uh, is, is came is, out of that time yeah 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 which makes perfect sense i actually just recently um because i've been wanting to get into writing a little more because i i enjoy it but i don't do it enough so i, I there's a deal on line for one of those maestro courses where the the english ones uh you know the ones you just watch the segments online yeah. and uh, i got the alan moore one so i started watching it and uh it's very interesting um it's well well worth it if anyone's interested in uh trying to take up writing but uh he, he makes you think about things in a way that you may not conventionally think about them when it comes to writing so it's, it's right check that out. yeah i love, I love it Mark. Yeah. yeah me too yeah. so uh yeah okay so you you're got a pregnant wife at home and you're trying to trying to navigate 
uh, yeah, like a career of, uh, of just trying to cobble together some sort of freelance career. Because I guess what would the film industry have been like in, in Nova Scotia at that time? Because it wasn't like, so what year would this have been? 90? Uh, 93, 94. So this is like a case, probably, actually by the time I graduated and stuff, it was probably up to 95, 96 by that point. So. Because you know, if, like several fairly famous movies were filmed here in like the in the nineties. I know it was the Dolores Claiborne, the Stephen King one, yeah, and yeah, uh, yeah. a few others. But it it seems like a lot more have come here since and and continues to now that the the film credit stuff sort of all got ironed out. But yeah, um, at that time, I can't imagine there was like a lot of shows being filmed here what like the lex maybe like what else would have been lex. Yeah, that, that was the big one that yeah uh, i never i never got on to uh, really you tried i assume i mean that uh, seems like a perfect fit for you that's amazing that yeah, for your I, style I, of art i did i did do a couple of days with a, a friend of mine who was doing miniature building miniature sets okay so um yeah just just uh yeah just building stuff out of styrofoam garbage and stuff but uh hmm. i was laura mcnutt and uh uh, so yeah, that was the, that was the only work I got on it. But it was it was a very it was a small visual effects team, digital visual effects team that was I was doing the work. And um, when it was I, fairly visual effects heavy too. Like you think it, it was, yeah, been, yeah, for the time, yeah, yeah. for sure. So, um, but uh, I was just too too new, too green, and they were you know hiring experienced people from uh, from away mostly. I think so, and I think I a think- lot of them still going to Toronto just because. Uh, didn't really have the base for it here yet like it, it was it was still percolating so i think that that trend is still still happening for the most part i mean i do think they do try to encourage the use of locals and and local canadian you know you can always say they couldn't find the right person locally which is why they go to toronto but sometimes i wonder if it's just a you know we'll we'll pay lip service to the union here by trying some people locally and then uh, go to toronto well, it's, it's not covered by any union or guild oh oh the effects mark you mean yeah yeah okay effects. so it's uh it was always the wild west when you know oh. yeah it was um uh that's surprising man that that it is yeah I'm, I'm especially because sure in other parts of the country but here the, yeah no, there's no guild or union which would cover it so every time i went to do a job i you know i'd start negotiating from scratch um that must have been hell oh yeah ridiculous <laughs> <laughs> I got to hear so many sad stories about how producers just don't have enough money to do it. And visual effects is left right to the last. So, yeah. uh, you know, of course, they're way out of money at that point, just coming out of pocket. Yeah, and, <laughs> which uh, is a huge important part of fin- like fin- finishing the movie and getting it ready to actually be put out. Yeah. Just to yeah. like do all that sort of stuff. Like, oh, the space battle. Yeah, I guess we got to get that figured out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, the budget's totally <laughs> gone by the time it got to me. Um, <laughs> uh, which, yeah, it, it was... It was tricky that way, but it was it was funny because what actually launched me into uh, uh, a career, like when I first started doing three D work, there there was there was really nothing out there. I did a couple of sort of videos for museums, and uh, somebody was doing a, a some sort of dictionary on a CD ROM. Remember CD ROMs? Oh, all- I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I sure do. Yeah, it's funny. My my newest computer doesn't even have a disk drive anymore. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. it's 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 amazing how, how technology has come. From yeah. I remember floppy disk trying to write something on that at school and take it to home. Well, I didn't have a computer at home, but friend's yeah. house, and then take it back, you know, or take it between classes. Just ridiculous. Yeah. Well, what the uh, what broke me out was uh, Flash. Oh, when okay. that crested. So, yeah. and I think that was uh 98 99 yeah i took graphic design in 2003 and 4 and that was flash was part of the course like it was part of the criteria yeah 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 yeah. well when it came out it was you know it was supposed to be for it was almost accidental how how it worked because um uh you know it it was meant for for internet graphics doing buttons and and you know and you know well there was a lot of there was a lot Mm -hmm. of interactive features to it and all the scripting that you could do with it uh, but it was very accidentally very useful for production animation, 2D mm-hmm. production animation. And that's what blew my mind because, uh, you know, this is a time uh, people are still on 28.8 baud modems. So um, <laughs> I think what, what was the first viral film was the, that Troops? Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. That was crashing servers all across. Yeah, the- I remember that the Star Wars fan film where it was just yeah. cops, but with troops, and it was it yeah. was wildly it was very entertaining and uh, it was great. Still but I, yeah, I do. Re- it's funny with that. Yeah, I guess that would have been one of the first uh, like really viral 
So the videos would have been shared around there, just crashing servers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, you know, you need the bandwidth, you need it to download the video. It was crazy. Yeah. Uh, so Flash actually sort of filled that gap for a while because it was vector-based animation. So you could actually download, you know, five-minute Flash animated film, and it was and it was tiny. It was you know the size of JPEGs and and stuff like that because it was you know all, all vector-based. Very little data has to be downloaded. So, um, uh, so. The first company, uh, so I, I taught that to myself. I didn't, uh, I, I just learned that. A few people introduced me to it and I picked it up from there. And then uh, I, I online, a um, job online creating animated greeting cards because that was a thing for a while. Mm, I do uh, remember those, yeah. Yeah, you email a greeting card. So you can go to the website and pick a greeting card and you email it to somebody and they can watch a little animation going. Um, mm -hmm. So I would just crank these out, three or four animated greeting cards a day. And on the side, that must have been very fulfilling creatively. Uh, it was, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I really, I really cut my teeth with that stuff. And oh, that's cool. Uh, you, you download a job, and it would give a, a written description of what 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 they wanted for the job. Sometimes it would talk about style, other times it wouldn't. So I got to make up a lot of things, and uh, they were pretty unfussy. You know, as long as it uh, played well and looked half decent, they'd approve it. So sometimes things came back, but very rarely. They just mm -hmm. want to keep. Turn them out. Falling through. So wow, that's um, super cool. Interesting. Wow. <laughs> I, I never would have thought like uh, when I met you that you got your start through animated greeting cards. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, on, on the side of that, yeah. Um, I was uh I, I started making a short film, um, which uh at first was just called The Insult. And uh, it was these characters that I designed. Uh, later on, somebody would say they looked like Dr. Zeus meets Terry Gilliam. Hmm. Um, and there were these, there's funny little mutant characters. Uh, uh, I eventually decided after I finished the first, the first one like that, I said, okay, I want to tell a whole story here. So I, I scripted out like a 13 episode, uh, five minutes each um, story arc for them. And I called them Tales of Earth, I-R-T-H. Mm -hmm. So, um, and there was no there was no talking in it all the characters were just like blah, 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 that kind of thing <laughs> i did all the voices myself for all these characters and um i put that on a website that a friend of mine had a you know had a hosting uh had a hosting business so he let me put up a website for free and um and at the time you know, there was i don't even think search engines were a big thing you know i think yahoo i think was out there mm -hmm. uh, so you could submit your your website to yahoo to be in their directory or something like that so i did that as much as i could but uh, uh mostly i was emailing people saying hey look at this animated thing i did and um it was just a silly story about uh, uh these creatures and going to a market and a uh, gunfight breaks out in the market and uh, a bunch of the weird looking creatures get killed and the end um <laughs> But then, the, the, then I came out. This whole story arc came out of that somehow. But uh, after that had been up for maybe two or three weeks, I, I was going in. I was looking at the um, uh, the analytics, and I could see the servers that people were pinging from. So, you know, at the time there was probably about ten different services in Halifax. So I could say, "Oh, okay, that's my friend over in Halifax. He's on the he's on the uh, Shabakdo net or something. I don't know. Yeah, one of these, uh, one of these little." Uh, uh, providers. And then one day I, I logged in, I saw dreamworks.com. Oh, wow. <laughs> I was like, Oh, uh, who's, who's, who's at dreamworks? Like just looked at, at my animation. And, uh, I thought maybe, I, I don't know. I, there's nothing I could do about it. I didn't know how to reach out to her. Yeah. Then a couple of days I spotted again and then I got a phone call. Oh, wow. And, um, dreamworks was working on a project called pop.com. Uh -huh. And at the time, all the studios were trying to get their heads around how to bring entertainment to the internet. I wonder if they ever cracked that. I wonder if they ever figured that one out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, YouTube eventually became the model, but at that yeah. time, nobody had any idea. That wasn't YouTube wasn't there, so it was like. Uh, uh, so was, so they they went they they sort of plowed into it with uh, like this old school studio model where they were looking around the world for anybody who knew how to use flash and could tell a story and just hiring them and, and then paying them, they were going to put all in one place. And that would be an, like an incubator. If they could collect enough fans to this one idea, then maybe that would, uh, you know, go over to, um, 
DreamWorks television or get developed into a TV series. Wow. And, uh, so, you know, all the, all the studios were trying something like that. There was like Warner Brothers had entertained them. Uh, and <laughs> the one that was doing really well wasn't associated with any studio. It's called icebox.com. I think I remember that. Mr. Yes, Mr. I, pretty, pretty yes, 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 yes. Yeah. I remember a lot of like with all that that sort of hard drinking Lincoln. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, I remember like I, growing up uh, watching uh, a lot of like Strong Bad and that sort of stuff, which was like oh, the yeah. early, yeah, the New early, yeah, 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 yeah. That's right, Newgrounds, and uh, a lot of the Homestar Runner and all that sort of stuff. Like it was uh, that was sort of what I remember as far as the early like flash style animations that were sort of breaking in. Everybody was watching. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, wow, that's DreamWorks call. That's that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So that 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 got some attention for me. I got a I got a cover on the coast, and uh, and uh, there was a lot of it's quite a bit of fanfare. But everybody in town knew my name after that. Um, so I got a call. You know, we, we uh, with the the guy who gave me the server space, we ended up um, you know creating a little company and uh, bringing in some investors and set up a studio, and we're going to produce you know. At DreamWorks wanted to commission not just the one they, they wanted to buy the one that I made, but also um, you know commission five six more right and, and send it over to see how it did and then would send it over to DreamWorks Television and maybe get it developed into a series. Wow! So uh, and I developed a few other things with them as well. Um, uh, there was one which was uh, the whole the whole pop dot com project was led by Ron Howard. <laughs> and, so who, I assume, like, who called you? Just some some person that worked there. Yeah, it yeah. Was, I never. Ron Howard wasn't was calling you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, my 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 moment of almost making contact was, uh, I think we got to episode three and we were sending them in, uh, and um, the guy I was talking to all the time. I can't remember his name. Shoot, uh, he was a lovely guy, but uh, he was he was my handler, I guess. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So he said, uh, the, and he just told me one day, he said, yeah, the founders just came out of watching your episode and they said it was pure genius. And I was like, the founders are uh, Ron Howard, uh, Jeff Katzenberg and Steven Spielberg. I was going to say, my God. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, which one said genius? <laughs> I left that writing somewhere. So, um, uh, but. Um, uh, wow, yeah, that's amazing. But, after a while, it was uh, pop.com was uh, it was one of those things. Paul Allen, one of the co-founders of Microsoft, was the money bags behind it. Mm. And um, it was one of those things is like, you remember, I remember, I think uh, South Park did that joke about, you know, underwear in something happens, cash out. That's right. Uh, uh, it was the, uh, the underpants gnomes. It was yeah. uh, collect underpants. And then, then the second step they didn't know. And the third step was profits. And then they, yeah. they, they never knew what the second step was. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was, that was, that was pop.com and about every other, yeah. you know, uh, startup venture of the time. But uh, so, okay, we'll make a bunch of cartoons and then something will happen and we'll make a bunch of money. Yeah. Um, Unfortunately, so that's gotta, something never happened. Eh? Yeah. And I, yeah. I think eventually Paul Allen include into this and it's just like, okay, I'm done. He pulled the plug on it after, after a while. And uh, the founders, decided this was too embarrassing so they just made it all go away um so it never launched uh but it was, really so your your stuff was owned by them but you just never don't know access to it anymore uh it, you could uh, you couldn't put it out now i assume it is it probably must be locked up somewhere uh, no you know what i did put it out um, oh okay it was it, we only ever had like this one um one page contract with them and uh, you know, somebody kind of whispered whispered it to me at the end. They're saying, "It's like you know what? Just do what you want. Nobody's going to come after you for this." Because they because mm-hmm. because it was such an, an embarrassment. They I think they just wanted it to go away. Um, and it was funny for for years afterwards. If you actually did a Google search uh, or a Yahoo search for pop.com, you would get zero results. <laughs> wow! It, it was erased from the internet. Now, if you wow. look at RDA Studio which was my company at the time. Yeah. You, find, you get all the hits for that and, you know, articles uh, all over the place that were saying, um, uh, you know, RDA studio, you know, teams up with pop.com. So well, you got me, look, you know, but uh, you know, so I tell people about pop.com, nothing, nothing. So it's like, I, I swear to God, I'm not making this. <laughs> <laughs> it was a whole thing. Yeah, Please really believe not. me. Yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, the founders okay. liked my stuff. Yeah. Just like <laughs> raving in the street, running around, grabbing people, saying phrases like the founders uh, said I was a genius. And like, oh, yes. OK. Perfect. Yeah, yeah sure, buddy. OK, yeah. well, you, you're you good. Doing good. Yeah, <laughs> you can find it now. But uh, but for, yeah, when I, when I was trying to put my resume and stuff out there, it's like it didn't it's like it never happened. Oh, wow. That's that's yeah. that's amazing and, and sad all at the same yeah. time. Oh man. But to be so close to that. Well it's kind of alarming, not alarming, but I guess and I guess when you're when you're a guy like those those three guys that you you'd see so much talent in the run of a day that it'd be hard to 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 catalog it all in your brain and go back to it when you need it. But you think they would have encountered so many interesting creators like yourself that that may have they may have followed up on some other project with one or two of them somewhere down the line. Like it just kind of staggers me that they just sweep it out and, and be done with it forever. Yeah, it was kind of odd. I mean that, that was that was another point when I was thinking about uh you know picking up the family moving to LA and um and uh, continuing my career there. But uh that window just didn't yeah you know, it just closed too fast. <laughs> How uh, many, uh, how many, I met your daughter, but how many children do you have? Just the one or uh, three, three. Okay. Yeah. So she's on, she must be what, like in her mid twenties now. Yeah. That's uh, my older daughter. Gwen is in, um, uh, uh, yeah, she's 24, 25, 24 now. Yeah, okay. And, uh, she had a real fake meats in Halifax. Oh, really? Okay, cool. Yeah. yeah. I should go yeah. visit her. I stopped eating red meat a while ago and, uh, so I still eat chicken and stuff, but, uh, I'm always looking for a decent yeah. alter. Pardon? Yeah. That's the place to go. It's real yeah. fake meats. Yeah. Yeah. Let's check this out. Yeah. Yeah. And, and um, my younger daughter, Jessica, uh, she's, she's trying to figure out what she wants to do. She's doing crafty stuff now. Mm -hmm. And uh, she tends, she tends to do all these funny little odd jobs, um, creative jobs for people, but she's another, you know, very creative person. And um, she doesn't live too far from here. She lives with a mom and, um, but she kind of, she has a studio here at this house. Mm -hmm. Oh, cool. Yeah. So awesome. Uh, uh, one of the, one of the I gotta sometime if you have time, I'd love to come in and see your studio. It's been absolutely, a long time. yeah. Well, I'm, I'm planning on between Christmas and well, this is actually going to air on the thirtieth, which uh, is just the day for New Year's Eve. So, uh, but I do plan on uh, maybe doing a Halifax day somewhere between Christmas and New Year's because I got off work for a week and a half. So okay. I'm just gonna just I don't plan on going anywhere around, but just maybe doing some day trips if it's some fun stuff. So. Yeah, yeah definitely. Awesome. Yeah, I'd love to check it out. That's a, it's a, like a house full of art studios. Sounds amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, okay. Well, obviously the marriage didn't work out. So, and and uh, you mentioned that they live with their mom. So, oh yeah. Uh, but <laughs> this just the artsy lifestyle made made it hard to maintain a relationship. Or, uh, well, it was. I, I was married when I was twenty two. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I can do it. Yeah, I can do it. You know, by the time you're 32, you're a completely different person. So, yeah, uh, you know, I met her in the UK, and um, well, we raised the family, and uh, you know, there was uh, uh, that was 20 years. Yeah. So, um, but uh, yeah, we had to we called it quits around 2016. Oh, so, right on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, because well, yeah, I remember seeing her around. I think when we did the film. Yeah. Um, but yeah. So going into that, I guess when did uh, when did that come about? When did uh, um, the the film, the short film, then when, when I met you the first time? Oh, uh, Jack and Jill. Yeah, which was called something else. No, it was I was always Jack and Jill, but you shortened it to kind of Jack and Jill because yeah, I think it's because that Adam Sandler movie Adam came out around the same time, <laughs> which you know you, people could easily confuse those two properties. You have this. Dark, yeah. brooding, uh, you know, sort of uh, meticulation on death and relationships, and then you got that Adam Sandler playing a male and female twin. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's hilarious. So, is that like where in the the story of your life are we getting close to that, or is there still? Uh, let's see. So, uh, well, just to blow through quickly, there was the yep. DreamWorks thing that launched me into some television and doing animated. Um, pieces for a uh, documentary series that kind of became my niche for many many years what series uh see so yeah, i started with the sea hunters okay uh and this shipwreck diving documentary series yeah so i would do the animations of the ships sinking uh mm. however, however they sank and then the, the dive team would go off and you know record and look around and, and um uh so that was that was that was great and while i was working with that team uh, I was with John Davis, I was the producer there. He and I produced a one-off animated documentary about fairies for CTV. Uh, the fairies of folklore. 
Yes. Okay. I do recall this. Um, I think it's because when I first met you, it was maybe one of the projects that you had shown me or something or parts of it. Right. Yeah. 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 So that, uh, that was kind of the, yeah, that was pretty much the, 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 the peak of my, uh, uh, you know, uh, Pick my career you, right there, film. How that do you was, sell a series about fairies to CBC? Like, did like is that uh, something the they CBC came to you, or or you pitched uh, to them? Uh, it was it was too easy. I think that was that was the problem. It was uh, uh, there was the what's it called? It was the Nova Scotia Film Development Corporation, which was mm. at the time headed by someone uh, Anne McKenzie, who was a real who it was uh, a real go getter person, really amazing personality, and she was. Um, you know, really fought for uh, producers and directors in, in Nova Scotia, a, a real vital force. Um, and uh, so when, when she found about, you know, the DreamWorks thing that I did, uh, I was one of her favorite people for a long time. So uh, I would go to her first if I had any ideas. And I, I remember I made up like, you know, this whole stack of uh, one pagers. So mm-hmm. just a pretty picture on one side and uh, two or three paragraphs on the back of different show ideas. And then I brought them to her and I got them there and I was like, what do you think, Anne? And she mm-hmm. goes, oh, these are lovely. Here, let me call somebody at CTV for you. Hey, hey, Robin, you want to you, you want to do a talk to my friend Frank Forstall here? And so I got a meeting with CTV and I walked in and my pitch was like the same thing. I walked in with a stack of things. And was, <laughs> what do you think? And uh, she was like, oh, I like this one. And we went ahead. Wow. It was never that easy again. <laughs> I was going to say, I think you walked through a hole in the fabric of space time there. And yeah. It yeah. was a magical universe where actually creative people get to explore being creative without having too much input from uh, from corporate because that, God, that never happens now. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. No, that was, uh, yeah, that was, uh, that got, uh, that, that was <laughs> shut down pretty quick, I think. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, that, that was, that was the kind of thing, you know, the end would kind of fight for you, give you at least wow. one chance like that. But, uh, um, so uh, this is this available like can you find this on youtube or somewhere out there is this documentary I, yeah i finally just stuck it out on youtube last year uh oh I great tried, i tried to figure out what else i could do with it um it's uh, it was kind of kind of encumbered for many years uh it was it was on youtube in these chunks mm-hmm. um it was like cut up into the separate stories and uh there was no credits or anything on them so um you know somebody on staff at the company had put it out there and then lost the password to the YouTube account or whatever. Uh, and then, so for, for years, I was just like, can we take this down, please? It, and somebody had gathered all of them. Like a playlist? Into a playlist and yeah. put a name on it. Oh, no. It was, it was just some, some guy, some schmo in the States. So it was like, Fairy Folio by Steve, what's his name? Uh, I was like, come on, take this down. So, uh, so I think it was uh, four or five years ago, I finally had enough of that and just called in a copyright uh, infringement on on that account. Good, that good, good, before. good. And then I removed it. So I got it removed and then I put, uh, and, and I was trying to for a while, actually, because um, it was in standard definition, oh, yeah. which is, you know, like on a screen today, it's like the size of a postage stamp maybe. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I wanted to, the 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 soundtrack for it was beautiful music by uh, um, a group called McCrimmon's Revenge, sort of global Celtic music sound, and narrated by Gordon Pinsent. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. So that so just Canadian the royalty was, right there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So and um, so yeah, just the audio was gold, and the uh, the and I was doing really experimental kind of animation using uh, what were we doing? We were doing these paintings. I had like fine art painters. Uh, it seemed like a good idea at the time, but I had a room. Yeah, there's these fine art painters who would do uh, oil paintings on tar paper because uh, it kind of looks like canvas. It feels like canvas when you're painting on it. And uh, of all the characters, and then we would digitize them, bring them into Flash, and then animate them sort of like uh, Monty Python style. Mm-hmm. So it was really a, kind of a challenging, uh, <laughs> a visually challenging thing. I'll but say. It's got its own charm to it uh but um, i don't think the terry gilliam style it seems like it's rudimentary but i feel as though it's there's a lot more work to making it as such than it than it would seem you know yeah. like it's yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah yeah so uh well when he was doing it of course it was frame by frame right but uh, flash you know you can tween things and so mm. uh but um uh yeah so when i looked at it even in standard definition i was kind of like yeah i didn't quite i didn't i never felt like it was finished 
um the whole thing had uh it sounds like it sounds like a lot of money it was a half million dollar budget for an hour of animation but even at that time that was half the price of, yeah you know it's really it was really five it should be um yeah like about a million per hour yeah uh, wow well. that's that's the standard budget kind of uh at the time it was so um it's been dropping ever since but uh um yeah, the animation like it's the the their stories littering the internet with animation studios that are effects effects studios that are just you know not yeah. paid or valued for the amount of work they put into it. And yeah. I remember how like there's all these lovely stories about you know how Keanu Reeves like bought the the VFX team from like Matrix like all motorcycles to to thank them for all the hard work they did in the series. And it's like that's lovely, but man, they should be paying. They should be you shouldn't have to like give them a special gift to thank them. They should be well paid for that work because without their work, that film series would be nothing. It would you know like absolutely nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, yeah. That uh, that came to a head when uh, what was it? Rhythm and Hughes that big studio out West shut their doors after they, you know, at the same time as they're getting a, an Academy award for the visual effects on life. of uh, was it life of pie. I think. Yep. Yeah. 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 So, but, you know, the, the guy, the guy got up and he wanted to tell a sad story and they just cut away from him. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to focus on your sad real life story, but I don't paid you for your amazing work that won an Oscar. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, um, but uh yeah, so I did. Uh, I did that fairy folio. Yeah, go check that out. Definitely, it's still. I'm it, going to. Comments sure. are lovely too that I'm getting on it because people remembered um, seeing it on CTV years ago and also seeing it uh, in its chunks when it was on YouTube for so long. And they're like, "Oh, I'm so happy to finally rediscover this and see the whole thing all together." So. Um, oh, I'm definitely going to catch this. This sounds amazing. Yeah, it's uh, amazing those things that stick in your brain from like when you're you're developmenting and watching them, especially with things like from us being from Nova Scotia. Yeah. you see like something on ctv or cbc that just yeah. sticks with you like there was something for years uh i mean wayne and schuster were a comedy deal here in canada they're kind of canada's answer to Abin Costello, but further down the line and we used to as a kid i used to watch them all the time i mean i'm sure you're familiar with them yeah but um they had a, they had a movie on ctv called their cbc called once upon a giant which is like a, a parody of like fairy tale stuff like oh, yeah one of them played the court jester one of them played the court doctor and and the the they were friends with the princess whose parents wanted her to marry a so the evil prince his name was the evil prince malokia and uh, <laughs> she wanted to marry prince daryl who's like the poorest prince in the kingdom because she loves him and they nice. try to help her and because of that they get banished and they have to go try to capture a giant it's a whole thing it's it's you know deeply canadian and very uh <laughs> You know, for what they do with the budget, it's actually pretty impressive. I mean, there are quite a few Canadian stalwarts that you would see pop up in it that have been in things since. Yeah, but, um, there, that reminds me too. It was one that uh, I've never been able to find again. It was I saw my sister took me to a film at the uh, uh, oh, Penhorn Mall Theater back mm-hmm. in the day. Oh yeah, and, uh, you know, that, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and uh, I, I think it was NFB or something like that, but it was a one-hour feature film. And it had, I think it was, it had a name, something like the, the great race or mm-hmm. the amazing race or something like that. Pretty simple name, but, um, and it was stop motion animated uh, story of, yeah, this, this race. And it was the first film that kind of, that gave me the feeling of, uh, which I wouldn't experience again until the um, speeder bikes in the, in the Redwood forest of return of the Jedi. Right. Oh yeah. Yeah. Kind of like, mm-hmm. Yeah. So, but this this funny little uh, stop motion thing and you know put you in the driver's seat of these cars whizzing 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 along this uh racetrack somewhere and um there's some you know the story there was some the bad guys and the good guys were trying to keep their electric engine working and they're patching things together and, and the bad guys are trying to pass them and stuff like that so well, you checked on the nfb site because like all those have. movies oh and you can't yeah. find it wow yeah i talked to the nfb you know people and stuff but uh they i don't know because i uh, i often will just throw that because that's like a free uh app you can just put on like any of your your smart devices to watch all these these crazy content like canadian content movies that are just uh, that are there there's tons of them yeah yeah um, yeah, yeah. yeah i ended up finding the movie i uh, used my friends my cousins recorded my the the once upon a giant off of tv and i used to have like a, a recording of a recording like a copy on vhs for <laughs> years but it was like all fuzzed out and i couldn't watch all of it there's one part where like a minute was gone oh just just the tracking was was messed up 
<laughs> so uh, I remember watching this thing because it was a musical too. Their songs, and I can still sing all the songs probably off my heart because I watched it so oh, many times as a kid. Yeah. But I remember just looking around trying to find it. I even emailed CBC to see if they could like tell me where to find it. Yeah. And uh, and and looking for it, I came across an IMDb listing for the movie. Where in the comments, a guy said, "I have a copy of this on DVD. If you, <laughs> if, you if you send me ten bucks in the mail or for shipping, I'll I'll mail to you." So yeah. I did, and I got it, and I got a wow. DVD copy of it, and I watched the part that I missed in the whole movie, and I made, I made copies for all my cousins because we all watched it as kids, like all the time. Yeah, and uh, yeah, it was it was really awesome, and I still have it. And every once in a while, when I meet a new friend who's into movies or somebody that is like minded, I'll, uh, I'll I'll throw it on just to be like, here's here's a fun. It actually still holds up as being a very fun movie. Like it, it's it's quite clever. Right, it's over guard. But yeah. Uh, yeah, it was cool. It's nice when you can rediscover that sort of stuff. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah. but I mean, even the fairy stuff, I'm going to go rewatch it. But if I recall correctly, there's always sort of, a, you know, a, a darkness, that sort of mythology. And it seems like that sort of ebbs into a lot of your work. The short mm-hmm. film we're going to talk about in your paintings currently, is that always something that sort of interests at you as far as artistic style goes? Or is it just a, like are you drawn to the dark and things? Yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, and yeah, mythology and folklore. I uh, was fascinated by that um, and uh, fantasy stuff too. I was, I was a big D and D nerd. So yeah. uh, I was the best DM and, and, you know, amongst all my friends, I was the best DM. So, and I would spend too much time uh, building worlds and, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, just, not enough time living in them. Yeah. 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 Exactly, yeah, yeah. Well, you, you, you know, even for the games, I'd spend so much more time building the worlds than actually playing the game. So, because that was the fascinating part to me is just coming yeah. up with, with stories, and I'd have these complex mythologies in all of them, uh, and there was always something that I was trying to capture. You know, of course, you know, Lord of the Rings affected me, and I think I read that when I was uh, eleven or twelve or something like that. And, mm-hmm. You know, it's such a personal experience for everybody who really. Oh yeah, The Hobbit for me probably around the same time. Yeah. Oddly enough, it was like I used to be an altar boy and nothing happened uh, when I was a kid in my mom's uh, my mom's church. And the, it was a uh, Anglican church. So, the you know, the priest was married and uh, his uh, or the minister or whatever, the minister. So he uh, super nice guy, really nerdy. And he gave me a copy of The Hobbit, told me to read this. And uh, I'll be forever grateful to Mark Kingsbury, whoever he is right now, because he uh, he gave me that book and uh, and led it led into a lifelong love of all that sort of stuff. So, yeah. 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 And, I, and I think what Tolkien Tolkien did, which uh, most uh, fantasy writers didn't really clue into, was he was he was really drawing directly from mythology. I mean, today you know, fantasy writers draw from other fantasy writers, mm. and they're so much into that, um, you know, inventing something new. Uh, yeah. But Tolkien didn't really do that. I mean, you know, he he, t- he took things from everywhere else. I mean, The Hobbit as a retelling of Beowulf is interesting, and uh, uh, if you look at it that way, it's it's. Uh, did I never put that together before? Yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot of parallels. Uh, yeah, holy yeah, crap! Yeah. I never thought of it like that before. That's that's an amazing uh, insight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. And um, uh, well, I, to flash my nerd credentials, I actually read the Silmarillion. Uh, oh, I tried. I, I every like five years, I try. Yeah. Uh, so maybe I'll just watch the new show because it seems like that uh, on Primes. It seems like that might be. That's not good. <laughs> seems like that might be. I, I, didn't, I didn't try. Uh, I, I kind of, I read up on what, you know, what their take on it was and, and they just, they, 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 they it's a, it's a whole other story. Really. Uh, damn. I was going to say, cause maybe that's an easy, I remember trying like, I tried reading that. It's funny when you're a kid and you're like, Oh no, there's more books beyond <laughs> these three. I can go read the prequel. And then you read it and it's like, it's like reading the Bible, but like a way <laughs> harder version of the bible where they're like yeah. you know in the first paragraph they throw 25 names at you and like eight of them all are the same person and you're like what? yeah, what? yeah. Hey, uh, I had this, when i was reading it i'd have my hand sort of on the pages where they had all the names kind of oh. flying <laughs> uh and it's funny because so many of those characters don't come back until like halfway through the book mm-hmm. right they're just sort of mentioned here and then like halfway through he's like oh by the way Here's what this guy did. He went off and he started an empire over here. <laughs> yeah. And like, you know, decades, centuries. And eventually you just paragraphs. pepper in a person that you recognize like Sauron, but he's wildly different than what he became. Yeah. And, you know, you learn where he came from, or like even she loved where she came from and all that stuff. And you're like, oh, that's kind of interesting. But man, there's, I, yeah. And I never even really tried with any of the, the lost books that, that Christopher Tolkien put out. Yeah, no, I didn't get into all those because they were, well, yeah, uh, there's some interesting stuff in there, but uh, you know how he kind of because he, he rewrote Lord of the Rings three times. Mm. Uh, so you know he'd start writing with Bilbo as the main character, and then get so far, 
uh, and then just say, no, that's not working. Start over. Uh, and then, you know, bring in some other characters. There was a guy named Trotter who uh, mm-hmm. would become uh, a Strider. Strider yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Yeah. Trotter becomes Strider. It's like, <laughs> no, he's going too slow. Let's speed him up. We'll make him Strider. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> prancing around him. yeah it's like uh, prancers after that <laughs> so uh but he but he drew so much from mythology as well so like his work always has that feeling and there was something in one of his i think one of his letters that he pointed out to somebody um uh, you know mythology always draws on nature you know is that like you know nate he he uh he's drawing from mythology but where did mythology draw from it you know looking at nature Mm. so you know there's uh, most of it most of gods and and creatures are explaining why natural phenomena happen really yeah you know like yeah. the lightning is the angry gods and you know the the trees are you That's know it's all, yeah, it's, all, it's all part of that but if you look at the way he describes things too he always touches back to nature in this beautiful yeah. way like you know so like look at the description of the arkenstone mm. you know, oh like right yeah snow on the mountains it's like you know yeah you know um well that's interesting too i never put that together either yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I'm looking at things in new ways here, uh, Frank. This is great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a uh, like, I've always I'm a big horror guy. I mean, I'm fantasy too, but there's always like what they call folk horror, which are like the 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 horror that sort of takes place in the in the woods and the little unseen places under the trees, the fairy folk, the mm. the nymphs, the uh, you know, Del Toro taps into it so beautifully in a lot of his work, like Pan's Labyrinth and um yeah, you know, yeah those sort of things he, even the devil's backbone where it's mostly ghosts but there's still this weird little well the hellboy too does it beautifully too but where you kind of match these this folklore this this imagery with mm. uh with with something a little more on the the, the horrific side yeah um, I mean, those are fantastical but even the ones like the wicker man or more most recently midsummer which is one of my favorite films that i've seen in the last little while like the idea of these uh these these people that worship nature more than any ever conventional gods and, and the things they get up to um and i always find it way more terrifying than than a standard guy with a hockey mask in the woods like the idea that anybody any kind of religious fervor and, and i guess when it comes to like folk horror it's often some kind of pagan ritual or something yeah and, uh, to, the idea that people are, feel justified in doing the horrible things they do and especially in in some conjunction with nature is this beautiful like mixture of, of creepy and eerie and uh i just love it so much it's one of my favorite subgenres of horror so I, I can definitely understand the appeal well uh there, there was a term uh i'd heard years ago uh for a very rare genre of horror uh spiritual horror hmm. and uh it was a term I, I think you know i never heard it applied outside of this one article that i was reading but uh, the writer was just trying to make this point it's like you know some of the you know some horror movies just really know how to tap into uh, uh, you know, uh, a spiritual horror within people, like uh, mm-hmm. you know, the ones he cited were like, um, uh, what did you say, Pan's Labyrinth? Yeah, and um, what was the one from the '90s with the Vietnam? Oh, Jacob's Ladder. Jacob's Ladder. Yeah, uh, and then like um, The Shining, and you know, just it's very, you know, it, it's kind of they all have that kind of special quality where. Uh, you're, you're not just dealing with uh, you know, jump scares and, and it's not just trying to freak you out as much as possible. It's actually trying to get into your, into your soul in some way. Yeah. They, they call it elevated horror now, elevated which, horror. Uh, yeah, which I don't necessarily agree with because it kind of makes it sound like regular horror is dismissed, and right? Yeah. you know, because yeah. you know, like, like Jordan Peele's movies are kind of described as that and Ari Aster's like hereditary and Midsommar are described as that. And yeah, uh, yeah, like yeah. E- even others um, that are a little more rudimentary, like X and some other the the cooler local ones, uh, yeah. or, or uh, more modern ones, are described the way. But yeah, you're right. There's something like even The Exorcist to an extent, um, and and yeah. The Wicker Man's a good example of that. Just ones that like get like it's almost like to me. I'm a big fan of John Carpenter, and he uh, he does a really good job of getting that existential horror. I guess you know that sort of cosmic horror. Like I once heard cosmic horror described as which is often attributed to Cthulhu stuff, but um, described as uh, the direct correlation between man's need to have explanation as to why things are the way they are Mm -hmm. and directly correlating against the universe's complete uncaring dismissal of that. Like, (laughs) like, 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 and I'm like, that, that actually makes a really good point. And a lot of those movies that you described do that as well, where there's this, this deeper need for meaning 
and yeah. the universe doesn't owe you anything. Certainly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The universe doesn't care. It's going to chew you up and spit you out and grind you up into like it does everybody else. But it, uh, you can it have your care. meaning for a little while, but then we're going to take it away. Yeah, you can think you have it, but you never have it. There's, yeah. you know, and uh, and and there is a deep need for humans to find meaning in things. And uh, and the idea that we'll never have that is 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 unsettling. <laughs> and that's, yeah. it's not even like there's something different between being scared of being murdered, something very physical, but also like that that there's some spiritual part of you that's never gonna have closure or have an answer is yeah. is in a way scarier to me. I don't know. Like that to me is is sadder and much more uh, will sit with you a lot longer than just being murdered. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so, that can be that can be kind of used a little too moralistically for, you know, and, and, and a lot of regular horror stuff is like, mm. oh, this person did something bad, kill him. You know? Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, the one who is the most pure got away. Uh, yeah, that's very standard in a lot of things, but I, I like when they, they play with those conventions. Like, have you seen uh, Midsommar or, or Hereditary? I have, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, the, yeah those Hereditary movies really shook me up. <laughs> those movies almost like, like they, they do such a great job. They just, you know, they just put the poster for his next movie, um, which is called... Oh crap! It used to be called Disappointment Boulevard, but they changed the name to like uh, something. Bo Bo wakes up, or Bo has a bad dream, or something like that. But any Bo's mad or disappointed. I can't remember. But um, anyway, they uh, someone once described it this way, and it, I think it's totally true that you the like the the tone and the feel and what you feel inside while you're watching these movies. It's almost cathartic when the people finally get get killed. You're like right. like you're almost like finally you know like like i've been you've been sitting in this dread and this angst for like so long that when they get killed it's almost a release like you're not like horrified you're almost like oh you know it's almost like and and i don't know it just plays with you you so well mentally if you yeah. ever have a chance check out his short films they're all on his website right yeah. there's a very yeah. disturbing one called like there's something wrong with the johnsons or something yeah. and it's a it's about a uh an abusive a sexual relationship between a father and son where the son is the aggressor Right. And it, it's not exactly something you would ever think about, but it's so well done. Right. And it's it's alarmingly, it's very interesting. It makes you think about things in a whole different way um, about relationships, uh, especially th- those sort of, you know, relationships. And yeah. to me, it was like, the, this should have been a whole movie. I don't know if anybody would have bought it, but it, it, uh, yeah. the because the, the concept is so horrific, but it's it's very interesting. And uh, yeah. yeah. I'll talk about that, yeah. Yeah, check it out. Watch it. All this stuff's very strange, but it's very good. All of it's very good. And we are going to stop it there with uh, the uh, talking about the films of Ari Aster, and uh, pick it up in two weeks' time on our next episode when we reveal the reveal. Ooh, it sounds like a magical mystery. Uh, when we play the second part of this interview with Frank Forstall. Big thanks to Frank for being on the show. Big thanks for you for tuning in. And, uh, yeah, check out my other podcast, X-Rated, the X-Men Anime Review Show, wherever you get your podcasts. There's a link on the website for this one and on the uh, United Federation of Podcasts uh, site as well. Check that out. That's another chance for you to listen to me prattle on with uh, with the co-host about X-Men. A lot of fun. And uh, yeah, tune in. In the meantime, I hope you have a happy new year. Uh, make sure you celebrate safe and uh, you have fun and uh, surround yourself with friends and family and, uh, and have a joyous time. And I'll catch up with you again in 2023.